Thank you so much for inviting me to this um, really interesting workshop. I am going to actually introduce a somewhat different approach, uh, mechanistic modeling to support uh, geriatric drug development. So uh, just some definitions to start. Um, generally speaking, all mechanistic modeling uh, uses biological data as well as biological understanding know-how to explore disease and drug mechanisms. So really we're coming at the problem here from a mechanistic perspective. Um, we can distinguish three main subtypes of mechanistic modeling. The first is um, quantitative systems pharmacology or QSP, where the central question is um, how do biological mechanisms and drug mechanisms or properties interact to produce clinical responses. And most of the time QSP focuses on efficacy. Um, there's also quantitative systems toxicology, which asks a very similar question, but really tends to focus on um, toxicities. Um, and then physiologically based pharmacokinetics or PBPK asks the question, how do physiological properties and drug properties interact to basically influence the PK uh, in specific uh, tissues of interest? So how can we predict the exposure uh, in the tissue um, uh, of interest. Um, my presentation is going to focus on QSP just because that's what my company, Rosa, uh, mostly focuses on. But I would argue that um, all of the uh, arguments that I'm going to put forth are equally uh, applicable to all of these types of mechanistic modeling. And I certainly could see a role for all of these subtypes of mechanistic modeling <clears throat> and supporting geriatric uh, drug development. So um, let's just take a step back for a minute and think about what are we actually trying to do when we're developing drugs? Um, really what we're trying to understand is if we have a particular compound, a new asset that is inhibiting a, a pathway, let's say, we have some evidence that it's doing that, we would like to know, um, is that going to actually have a beneficial clinical outcome in patients when we inhibit this pathway? So how do we get from here to predicting clinical outcomes? Well, one way to do that is by really bringing in mechanistic understanding of the disease process and of the role that inhibiting this particular pathway may have in uh, affecting the pathophysiological processes and ultimately the clinical outcomes. So this mechanistic understanding, um, there's always uh, a story that you can tell about why your drug might be beneficial um, in, uh, in the population. And that mechanistic understanding is always informed by a range of different types of data, including in vitro data, preclinical and clinical data, both for your own compound, um, but also you know, very much um, historical information in the literature. Um, so what QSP modeling does, it basically takes that mechanistic understanding and turns it into an explicit mathematical model of disease and uh, drug effects. Um, and once you have that model, that is then testable. Then you can ask the question, okay, what if we inhibited this pathway or that pathway? Um, how would that, what difference would that make? And very importantly, might different types of patients have slightly different um, versions uh, essentially of this disease uh, state, we can, we can um, represent that as different virtual patients in our models to see if we get different outcomes when you have uh, variability in the underlying uh, physiology. So um, how is this useful in drug development? Well, once you have clarified the mechanisms by building your model, as I mentioned, I'm sorry, you can then use that model to inform every step of uh, drug development. So anything from compound evaluation um, all the way through to um, post-marketing studies. And ultimately the goal is always to reduce risk, to reduce the risk of taking that next step in development. So how do you get more information or more insights out of the data that you already have so you can mitigate the impact of variability and uncertainty all along the pipeline. Um, I would argue that 
for the geriatric applications that we're talking about, um, <clears throat> what's of particular interest is the utility of QSP in supporting different clinical trial design. So perhaps you would make different dosing decisions for the geriatric population, for example. You could explicitly look at combinations with um, drugs that they're already on, for example, um, comorbidities, et cetera. And then the patient stratification aspect is also really important. Um, as we saw earlier today, there's a huge amount of variability uh, among the geriatric population, even more so than, um, than in the general population. So it could be incredibly informative to be able to build different types of virtual patients representing different subtypes of geriatric um, uh, patients and to then test uh, how would a particular drug, a combination of drugs perform in these different types of patients. So that's the idea. And the um, workflow that I would envision here is um, we would start by building a QSP model, drawing from all the data that I mentioned before in vitro, preclinical, and clinical. Um, typically, most of that clinical data will come from non-geriatric uh, adults. So we would build an initial QSP model um, of the non-geriatric general population. Um, and what we then want to do is to refine that model to be more specifically representative of the geriatric um, population. Um, and we can do that by really bringing in some additional information. So there's a whole nother set of literature and we saw some of this uh, earlier today. Um, a lot is actually known about the differences between non-geriatric and geriatric physiology, things that happen uh, during aging that may impact um, both the drug PK and the drug PD. Um, so, um, and these are all very important aspects of, of dosing in a, a geriatric population. So there are the physiological effects of aging. Um, there's also comorbidities and polypharmacy. Um, and of course, as we've discussed at length today, um, these aspects really introduce a lot of heterogeneity and, and a lot of um, combinatorics. So if you really think about the different types of patients that are out there, and that's where, where I would think that having these different virtual patients to explore the impact of um, these differences uh, within the population, that would be really helpful for better anticipating clinical outcomes in this uh, population. So I don't have a case example today from, from uh, geriatrics, but I do have a pediatric, pediatric example. And I think that you will uh, see that the approach is quite similar and a, a similar type of um, workflow could work well uh, to, to look at um, the geriatric population. So in this example, um, this has been uh, previously uh, presented. This was work that Rosa did with Amgen. Um, and the basic a challenge that uh, Amgen had was they wanted to look at optimal dosing regimens for a bite antibody that they were developing in uh, uh, B-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia or BALL, um, which in, and they wanted to look at adults, children, and infants. Um, now they did have uh, phase two data in an adult population, but not in the pediatric populations. So the research approach is very much what I just outlined. We developed a QSP model initially, drawing heavily um, on the uh, information that we had for the adult population. Um, we represented disease progression. We also represented the mechanism of action of their therapy. And then we created a number of different adult uh, virtual patients to match the phase two data that they had collected. And then uh, we went back into the literature to look for uh, known immunological and physiological differences between adults and children, implemented those differences and basically made pediatric versions of the model that we could then use to um, predict response in, in that population. Christine, so, you have two minutes to go. Okay, thank you. So the, the program impact here was that um, this really uh, increased confidence for moving ahead in pediatric populations and also helped uh, Amgen identify dosing strategies for the different subpopulations.
So very briefly, I won't go into the details here. These are some example results from the adult model that we created, um, where we were able to reproduce uh, different types of response profiles, responders, non-responders, and relapsers. Um, again, I won't get into the details here, but what we were then able to do is to um, generate a pediatric version of that model with somewhat different results in the pediatric population by incorporating uh, these differences uh, between adults and children. And I've listed them here just to give you an idea, but it ranges from everything from basic physiological um, parameters such as bone marrow volume, plasma volume, to also um, uh, immune, uh, immune system um, maturity. Um, we had various data for B cell, uh, malignant B cell production rates, et cetera, in that um, BALL population. So by incorporating this, we were able to make the model more childlike. And as I mentioned, use that model to um, investigate the response in children. So the key takeaways here, and that was a very high level um, overview, but I really think that this type of mechanistic modeling, uh, it helps connect the dots between mechanisms and outcomes. And it really allows us to bring in some of that additional information that we already know um, about the geriatric population. Um, you can use the non-geriatric adult physiology uh, as a baseline and then layer on the additional information for the geriatric population, um, incorporating effects of aging, comorbidities, and polypharmacy into the model. Um, and that geriatric model then could be used to better anticipate uh, the systemic outcomes in different types of uh, geriatric uh, patients, which would ultimately, of course, help reduce risk and potentially customize treatment uh, based on some key uh, attributes in those populations. Thank you.